So it's really, really fantastic presentations. And it's really in a, what I find also fantastic is that all of this is supposed to be early stage work. So yeah, so people are very busy. Uh, so what I, uh, for example, something that I would like uh, to, to, to discuss is uh, how do you see, especially with this last presentation, I thought uh, when I start to digitalize environments like this and uh, we start to make them available, you, you, you can kind of uh, use this as a strategy for heritage preservation, et cetera, democratizing culture, demo democratizing the access to, to heritage. But you can also think, start to think about things like, um, you know, cultural transplantations to create social cohesion, uh, to, to bring people together. And I find this very interesting. So this is something that, uh, that perhaps I can, I can initiate with it this open question to everyone. What do you think it's happening with all of those digital technologies? I think this is also something that is related to what uh, provides in has been doing and her colleagues have been have been doing uh, in terms of uh, cities uh, and uh, putting the digital lay on cities, etc. So I open I open to the to the office. So we, you can throw some ideas there as well. Uh, sorry, so, sorry, Abel. Could you just repeat the question? I just didn't understand quite quite your exact it's a, question. It's a, it's a more of a, an, an observation. So, for example, when we add this layer, when we capture environments, and uh, we can enrich this virtual environment with um, even more things, uh, or overlay the enriched environment into the real world, in the real environment. This, this is a, a strategy for heritage preservation, yeah? But it's also a, a way to, for example, transplant cultures. So I never been to that particular temple in India, but there is the potential that I can experience that space from my place here in London, from, from my house, etc. cetera. Uh, and then this, this creates um, kind of social understanding you know, there is an opportunity to create presence, you know, like in, in a virtual environments research and in virtual reality, there is also this uh, line, uh, line of research very uh, preoccupied with uh, what is presence in the virtual environment, what make us feel in a particular space and place and how this, um, how this can be improved uh, over time in virtual environments. And uh, we are succeeding, uh, so yesterday, we, uh, we, we had some comments from Professor Kate Jeffrey, a neuroscientist saying that we can trick our brain to believe that it is in a particular place using current VR technology and that the technology is only getting better. So how do you think we could come up with these strategies for social understanding, social cohesion and so on? Now that all of this technology is emerging and it's really start to work really beautifully. It, it, it's it's a question, but there's also an observation, and it is just to um, get your views. Um, maybe maybe I can just quickly jump in. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. I kind of understand your question. As for example, with augmented reality, virtual reality, and even diminished reality that we have now, that a lot of uh, virtual environments is kind of synthesized environments, and how that kind of tap into our effective experiences, to which I think um, our project current with Artem, Ali, and Yancy, we're kind of uh, looking into this, but instead of providing an answer to what is um, our perceptual experience, we're thinking that maybe uh, we should facilitate a system where we can collectively participate and contribute information so that we create kind of a communal information environment where we can all um, take different perspective and then together from this different vantage point we combine a space that is um, communal to all of us and that is gonna record um, at all the happenings that have happened everywhere and then we may be able to reconstruct events and truth in a collaborative manner. Right. So one question then for you provides, uh, and uh, sorry, Alvaro, you can also intervene. Yeah, feel free to intervene. You, you, uh, but that one quick question is, um, 
so in a, in game theory in general, in decision making theory or risk and prop, uh, in a, in a decision making theories in microeconomics, we have this concept of uh, maximin. So what's the minimum we need to get the maximum outcome in decision theory? Uh, so we have lots of different maximins in different equilibria in game theoretical models, right? And uh, you you show this amazing. Um, overlaying of information in real space and, uh, and, and you think oh my god this is really a lot you know uh, some people might not like so much information being thrown at you uh, or, or some, some people might love it you know and it might actually be addictive so what do you what are your thoughts about you know uh, there's this concept of uh, maximin you know and how can we get the maximum outcome with the minimum uh, minimum resources as, as a definition of maximin. It's a question for me? It's a question for you. Okay, I think that is such a tough question because game theory yeah. is defined to be for uh, modeling the decision of rational decision maker. And when we talk about effective experiences, which is something of social perimeter, yeah. I am kind of afraid to, <laughs> you know, kind of say, okay, that's the econometrics to which we're going to produce an effective <laughs> experience. So what Karen is trying to do is that we're going to portray this future and let the audience tell us what they actually feel about it instead of like, uh, <laughs> yes, no, it's true. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something to think about. Uh, uh, the, another question that I have, it's for, um, Dingy. um, just checking if you are there. That uh, was, uh, yeah, Jingji, uh, uh, yes. You, yeah, you are there. I'll ask you to ask to unmute. Okay, one thing that I thought was very interesting about your presentation is, is, is that uh, you're tracing uh, the use of space uh, uh, and uh, creating this, this graph. I just wonder if you came across linkography and entropies in linkography. Is it, what linkography is interested, uh, like when uh, Gabriela Goldschmidt started to develop linkography in her seminal paper, basically what she was tracing the uh, how ideas come back to the table when designers are designing together. You know, how an idea it's proposed in the beginning of a design process and it disappears. And then uh, weeks later, the same idea comes back. And it is just showed, it doesn't show that the idea was thrown away in the beginning. It just shown that that idea was actually instrumental for the development of the design. Uh, and actually, depending how long the idea goes away and come back, the more valuable or the more fundamental that idea is. So you have lots of uh, interesting research done with linkographs. It seems like now you are proposing something similar, but in relation to how we use exhibition spaces. So when we design museums, and I designed some museums before, I worked a little bit briefly on the British Museum uh, when I was, uh, was working for Norman Foss, and I also work on another museum in, uh, in Boston, the MFA. And uh, uh, it seems like when you organizing the, the, the display of art, you know, we try to anchor art in these spaces so we know people are going to come back. But this is something we do intuitively. So I don't know if you actually have some evidence of that. And if you've considered linkography. You mean people like come back or? or... Yeah, they, they, they see something and they, they can see like, a, 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 some, like, for example, if you're in the Louvre, you can see the Mona Lisa. If you are early in the morning and uh, you don't have to face uh, a, a kind of a crowd, <laughs> you can go and see the Mona Lisa. And you know, you, you know the Mona Lisa is there and you know you're going to come back, but you carry on, uh, but with the intention to come back. Um, if we combine this to um, what, what, what we are doing right now, actually, I didn't mention it when I was talking, but I actually um, wrote it on, on the slide. Um, so I'll... I'm not sure if this answers your question, but um, we do observe that um, this is actually, this could be an iterative process um, that at each round of interaction, um, people may behave differently and the result of the observation may change. Um, and also in terms of Mona Lisa, I think um, the, um, the point here is actually we do look at museums and we do um, read, um, relevant literature review about the traditional um, museums. And um, there are also, it's also a kind of interaction, for example, 
looking at Mona Lisa, taking pictures, posting other pictures. It's also kind of um, engagement. Um, yeah, yeah, people come back for a few times, but each time with a different purpose and each time with different um, behaviors and different objectives. And um, if we're looking at this case, I think we'll be, we would be more interested in if people really look at Mona Lisa from the curator's perspective, if people really appreciate art as we um, expect, because most people are not from professional backgrounds. It, does that answer your question? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, yes, because I think there is a pattern of behavior there that uh, it's very adaptive. And this leads me to a comment for Tyson. Uh, I was just thinking, Tyson, that like the the you know you leveraging uh, unity to do what it's doing at Zaha. It's really fantastic, and the work that Patrick and the practice is doing on this is just fantastic. Uh, so I just wonder how deterministic this model is, and uh, and uh, how how uh, adaptive the decision model, the decision making modeling is. In your yeah, system. yeah, yeah. Um, that's so far, that's it's kind of like simplified. Yeah, but that's that's yeah. my question for Tyson. Tyson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, basically, it's working on a. Let's say there. I mean, there is a degree of probability and a little bit of stochasticity into the decision making, but it's primarily deterministic by weighing through these kinds of equations. So basically, we're through a series of equations trying to um, quantify decisions, right? So for example, I can, in a linear way, map the distance between me and, and an object. Um, and I can use that as a small bit of information to, to, to factor into my decision to go and do something at that object or to do something else. Um, and it's kind of an accumulation of, of these various behaviors. Now, obviously, oh, continuously it comes up this, this notion that we can actually reduce decision making of individuals to such a method is you know quite far-fetched in some sense but in the other sense i don't believe that it is because i think that our larger goal is more focused on collective behavior over a larger crowd um and so, so my hope is that you know we're, we're also involved in a very large research grant at the moment that i'm about a year and a half through um which is trying to get also additional empirical data um, about human experience um, that we can try to then filter into this model. And again, as I said before, kind of calibrate it, right? Um, so I kind of see this as a series of puzzle pieces. We, we can get information from um, occupancy sensing. We can get information from surveys. Uh, as I said, social networking. Um, and we try to fit that in to come to the most accurate model that we can um, to quickly simulate behavior. Um, in terms of answering your question, uh, we did we did a number of studies where we would run the same model over the same space, uh, you know, 20, 20 or 30 times. Um, and the results we get are very similar. Um, not exactly the same. So the number might, but the numbers and quantities are very, very similar. So you can see a bit of that, like very slight stochasticity in the crowd, but also um, a very deg a degree of determinism that's factored through those equations. Hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Yes, I mean, this is this is all work in progress, like, and it's not a simple, straightforward topic. It's it's a very complex topic. Uh, Indeed. That there is a one link there that I want to make to Zin Hawking's work, uh, and it's uh, you know, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure that if you cover that map at in UCL, you would get a different result. If you cover the UCL map plan that you have near the door, yeah, you would get a very different outcome. Do you think this is a fair comment? I'm just saying, what I'm saying is uh, the, the, the behavior, uh, you know, when people are um, gazing at things as they navigate space, this is very uh, adaptive and is very dependent on what the, the, you know, the, the, the points of interest or saliencies in that space, what they are. So did you try to run the same experiment by covering the UCL map on that corridor and see if people look at other things, if they look at the artwork? So this is, this is a, a comment just to see if uh, th there are things in the duration and frequency, uh, the duration and frequency of the, our, the updating of our mental map to navigate and, uh, and how this correlates to objects that are in that space. Yeah, actually, 
when I was capturing the data, I was actually sitting by the side of the, the UCL map. And I see the patterns a little bit like different because I'm kind of like sitting, showing my back to, to, the, to the pedestrians. So I think uh, I didn't try to cover the map, but I think for me, like standing as a physical object in the, in the space, still kind of having an effect that, okay, this is a little bit different. So their behaviors is quite different because I'm sitting there. And I actually, I was trying to place a camera like in the scene. So that having a, a kind of effect on their navigational behavior because they notice, okay, there's object in the scene. It's, it doesn't exist before, like yesterday. So they kind of like change their behavior because they're looking at that site as a salient object. And maybe they're in their man, mental map is kind of changed why there's a camera, but I still wanna go to the UCL map. I think um, that is the purpose, the initial purpose. We wanna kind of place different object to see I think that's maybe the next step to place different objects with the different colors to see which part, which kind of objects will be more being the attractive elements in space will be kind of change their uh, purpose of the movement. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot to do with choice, the saliencies in the space choice and also spatial asymmetry now we know. Um, so there are a few questions for uh, Rob Woodbury. There's one question from Robert H. Question for Woodbury. Just wondering whether the solution space system supports solution space navigation for the user and selection against defined criteria. I think Hi, this Robert. is. Oh, so yeah, you, you seem to know each other. Okay. Yeah, we know <laughs> each other. Robert, you're making a fundamental error. I call it that the fallacy of appealing to an oracle. And that's that uh, the error is that any automatic system for solutions based exploration can actually do anything that's that meaningful in the context of design. And Bradner's paper in 2014 said it really well that experts will use the result of a solutions based exploration as the input to the next phase of design, not as a final solution. That said, the design of D star has hooks for every imaginable solution space exploration idea I know about. So it provides it, it hooks for interacting with existing solution space exploration. Putting solution space exploration in its proper place as an adjunct to design and not as a, a, not as a final determinant. So in answer to your question, we've got the handles for working with solution space exploration in a way that will embed it in natural human design processes. Okay. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, Rob and Robert H. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, yeah. I, I, must, okay. I must say, I know Robert well, so <laughs> my, I chose a very blunt voice to respond. Yeah, so this is a very interesting uh, response. Uh, just saying that uh, we will have a, a social networking link. Uh, it's, a, it's a Zoom meeting link so everybody can switch on and off their cameras and and microphones and it is will be on until six o'clock here today so you can just join and carry on uh the conversation i hope you do that uh i think just uh just one final question from my side i think uh and alvaro maybe you can uh can help on this question as well but this is a question for luke uh, look, very interesting. Uh, I, I'm, and I am uh, deeply interested in bioprinting, and in particular, how we can use GP, GPU to improve geometries for bioprinting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, why not bioprint a heart or something like that, something complicated, you know, because people have been print, bioprinting yeah. things like bladders or yeah, I think yeah. a, a Moffield Eye Hospital here in London, they are attempting to uh, 3D print uh, uh, an eye. Mm -hmm. to replace an eye because it's uh, we get into the point that uh, we can 3d print things that are complex enough so we can redesign and print them of course we cannot print a heart or a brain we decades away from that i believe uh but it's it starting to happen so my question is bioprinting like uh, how some of the many materials we use it seems like you're using the right technique uh, you know, uh, voxelized models, they, they can mm. handle the level of complexity we need. But I'm just thinking how, what, what uh, my question is, it, it's a very trivial question, I'm sorry, but I'm just, 
uh, interested in uh, what are the limits of uh, MRI scanning and how do we interpolate the layers? Yeah, so um, MRI is actually, it's, it's relatively low resolution. So um, MRI, you can think of the, the original scans as, as being sort of like voxels. So it generates voxels instead of, we, we see it as slices, but actually they're represented as voxels. The resolution, I, I mean, um, I think it's about one millimeter, which in on the scale of a, a body is obviously very kind of macro. There's obviously other uh, modalities. So things like CTs, you can get micro CTs, and then you can look very, very um, closely at things like the structure of bone. And then um, you, can, you can see the, the kind of structure of uh, cortical bone and things like that. What I thought the most interesting part of um, uh, my, my project is actually that the, the, the software interpolates between the scan slices um, and it generates these sort of virtual, um, uh, virtual images, virtual brain slices. Um, I, I think that there might, there, there might be a role of um, AI and machine learning in using like um, sort of <laughs> medical imagery and sort of up resing it, if that makes sense. So you might be able to use combine lots of different modalities and then also almost generate like a, a virtual model because ultimately when when you're creating something for tissue engineering you're, you're sort of you want to simulate nature it doesn't have to be completely accurate mm -hmm. if that makes sense you want yeah because life yeah. takes over right yeah exactly so the idea is that a scaffold is similar enough so that um it has the same mechanical properties but then at the scale of the cells, the cells will look at um, sort of receptors and chemical um, receptors that would be on the scaffold, but that's at a whole different scale. On the macro scale, it needs to be roughly similar. Okay, that's that's really fantastic. I think I, you've seen the, the fantastic advancement on uh, multi-material printing as well. Yeah, recently. exactly. So um, I know I know that scientists in, in, in Harvard and, uh, and the other one in MIT, working on that project and uh, actually he's a very good friend of mine who we did our doctorates together mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I, I just fascinates me exactly because of that because life just takes over and it it seems to know what what it has to do it's very interesting yeah. and it's yes. um, yeah embryology and all those things are very interesting as well like how how does how how does uh, these cells how do these cells know how to build a body you know mm -hmm. And yeah, Alvaro, I don't know if you have any experience with that, but I find I find is uh, you've you've been dealing with things like that as well. I mean, I think it's something that is happening faster than you think, Abel. That uh, I know that I really I'm not a hundred percent sure whether it is Jerusalem or Tel Aviv University that they already three D print. I believe is a kidney for a rat, mm -hmm. uh, functional kidney for a rat, uh, and I, I think that is medium complexity thing, uh, not, obviously not as complex as an eye, but for sure uh, more complex than, for example, a bone. Yeah, like but that. I mean, a kidney is more complex than most buildings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. so I think it's not that far, it's because also, for example, the technique that, that Luke uh, is using, which is the Stratasys printer, uh, some of the resins, especially the ones that are solvable to water, they are basically a sugar-based Racing. So I'm sure they can grow things on them uh, with very tiny adjust adjustments for sure. So I don't see like probably there is a very uh, we can say simple like accessible way <laughs> to, to to grow some tissues. Like for example, I was thinking that uh, with these systems you can easily bring some sort of a scaffolding to grow skin, for example. Which I know it grows easily in a, in a in a lab. Like you can grow cells um, and tissue relatively simply. Uh, so, for example, with all those people that get burned or serious burning, or or even with uh, uh, melanomas and stuff, uh, I'm pretty sure they, they they can help with that. And in a short term, like I'm 
mm. picking is not that far because yeah exactly i mean there's there's obviously a a, a hierarchy really yeah. so, um things like hollow hollow organs um blood vessels trachea windpipes skin is relatively simple and it's it, it it's almost happening now um things like kidneys like solid solid cells that's quite quite a way away i mean like 15 20 years because you can if you could make a small kind of functional unit so um the the nephrons in a kidney or like the hepatic cells in a, a liver then you could just scale that up in theory but we're quite far away from having those like functional functional units but actually in lungs uh, people have got quite quite far with that as well oh, yes. all, the, all the single tissue porous organs i think they should be yeah. quite accessible in the short term mm -hmm. uh, and also even I, I, I could imagine bones which for example i know one of the main problems in general with bones is very very difficult to replace and at this point you can only replace specific situations like the, the hip or something like that mm. but especially if you can grow them with the same cells as the patient probably you can yeah. insert bones to replace uh mm -hmm. damaged tissue or something like that i can imagine which uh, could be very beneficial yes uh, i yes really but i think you know the way to handle that level of complexity it's uh, voxelizing geometries i think I, I don't know if you've been playing with a mud box and you know, that brush and, and things like that. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> but uh, I'm so surprised because I thought it was different. Like, uh, look, uh, mentioned that the, the CT scan is just one millimeter resolution. The the MRI, sorry. MRI, oh, yeah, the MRI, yeah. Because I was thinking, like, the printer you used is 0.1 millimeter resolution. Mm. So, so you can achieve, like, if you have the right software, probably you can achieve more precision than the, than the, than the scanning model. And improve uh, with so much learning probably to get a better uh, printing of mm -hmm. of, uh, of the organ. That's super interesting. That how this yeah. is <laughs> ahead of the scanning technology. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So yeah. Sorry, Luke. Any any final comments? On oh, that? I was just, no. just going to say yeah. You could almost combine different technologies. Mm -hmm. So you could combine like microscopy, which is obviously incredibly small scale, and MRI and sort of make this virtual super super um so that yeah i was i was trying to actually 3d print um so these synchrotrons you know the um particle accelerators mm -hmm. and those you can get incredibly incredibly detailed um images but also macro scale but um, in synchrotrons you mean like the the pro proton therapy uh... yeah yeah so because the wavelength is so small um, it's smaller than x-rays, it's, it's tiny, so really, really incredible, incredible resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but they're huge, huge data sets. Okay. I have just one final comment before we close, and then Professor Jeremy Melvin can uh, give his final uh, remarks for the conference. It's, it's just a quick question to Eliane. Uh, so, very interesting presentation. You know, my question is, can the space be a player in the model? Because uh, in, uh, again, if you, if you go back to uh, risk and prospect theory or decision-making theories like uh, design uh, mechanisms, uh, or mechanism design, sorry, or um, you need to unmute yourself, uh, and, uh, or game theoretical modeling, you have a number of models where uh, there is kind of this overarching player in the game that they often call nature. You have nature and you have the players. So do you think that they space, they, they space, can, uh, like, uh, can you uh, leverage uh, space syntax as a play in the game? Uh, so I didn't hear very good the beginning because it was hard, the video. Ah, okay, so I'm just asking if, uh, if, you, if you see, uh, for example, using space syntax as, uh, as a play in the game. As a measure, uh, I use space syntax measures as a way to measure, yeah, measures for and a new logic to place points of interest in the in the in location based games. Um, okay, because you have some models, you have some models out there, for example, there is the Monopoly game, not the Monopoly game, the, the, the board game, but the, the game theoretical model. There is also the Centipede game. 
in a number of other games where they one of the decision makers of the game is nature or is the space where they are in. And uh, the utility function takes in consideration nature, what nature would do. So it's literally model as, a, as an agent in the game. And mm -hmm. I don't see why space syntax could not be the same, but it's just an observation. I, 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 I've seen that you, you map me all this. And these are not location-based. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if they are table games. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was uh, uh, more exploring location-based games, and because the designers cannot uh, change the real space, um, so they can take advantage of these uh, features that space syntax measures can give. For example, open spaces, uh, um, uh, hide uh, occlusive areas. You can detect these spaces and then use them for the game for some new features. Right, I see. Interesting. So I, uh, so I, I, that's all from from my part. I'm I'm aware of the time. It's uh, it's almost five p.m. here in the UK. So I would ask uh, uh, Professor Jeremy Melvin when you're ready, uh, we can uh, we can display your presentation. Uh, if you have your presentation on your desktop, you can you can share that. So I'd like to thank you, everyone, uh, in the poster session for the really fantastic work you've been uh, presenting and talking about. Uh, and uh, I feel quite privileged to, to, to be hosting this session. Thank you very much.